brings up a lot of emotion. You certainly feel like you're part of something special, you're connected to it. it it's very distinctive, um, certainly very mechanical. The Germans make things beautifully and they just happen to go extremely well. They are just a fantastically practical sports car. To me they're just a cool car, they're just, they're, they're all race cars, they're all built for a purpose, it's just that whole German engineering sort of thing about it. It was the noise. Um, that's what drew me to Porsches when I first got into them. I remember distinctly at my high school uh, a 928 that used to arrive to pick somebody else up and the purr that it had was just wonderful. The sound of a, a flat six is, is very different from the, the sound of, of anything else. The air-cooled cars are particularly special because being air-cooled, there isn't that water jacket around the, the engine block which absorbs some of the noises. So they've got a, a mechanical thrashing that is, that is all their own. And you, you hear that even, even at low revs, you can hear that they just sound different and they sound more mechanical than, than just about anything else. I just like the shape of them. I think I like the fact that they're very simple, right? I mean, the original cars, the G-Series cars and the cars before that, they're very simple in their design. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's something. It's a combination. I, I just love the, the function. I love the, the purity of the design. There's that real classic element to it, which I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to things that are quite clean and minimalist. It's almost no matter what Porsche I'm driving on a road test, children to grandparents all like to have a look. So, you know, driving them, it's something special. It's a, it's a different kind of car. There is a real passion there around, around the mark and around the fun that it gives us in terms of ownership, experience. I don't know, I think there's just something unique and different about them. Um, the whole idea of rear engine, rear wheel, for most of them, I suppose. Um, and the feel of, you know, you can jump in an early one, like, say for instance, an early 911, you can jump in one of those and or right up to a GT3, you can still feel the difference or feel the power come through the wheels, every little bump through the steering wheel. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's really, really exhilarating you know, driving down Curl Curl Strait with, you know, a classic Porsche, just looking out and there's the ocean on the left side and it's just, it's just unbelievable. To some, things might be a bit basic, but it's right at that point, just before it touches that rev limiter, that it, you really, you really know that you're alive.
I remember when I was at school, I did a class called Power Mechanics and it was really the only thing I was good at at school. My careers advisor at school said, oh, you know, I'll see if I can get you a gig at this workshop. I didn't know until I actually turned up that it was actually at the Porsche workshop. Grant came along into the network as an apprentice. So I taught him through being a head mechanic and also through my workshop manager. For the whole week, I was there first and I left last. I just couldn't get enough of it and I thought, this is really great. So I said to the workshop foreman there at the time, how do I get a job here? This is the coolest place on earth. By the end of that year, I'd already had the job lined up long before I'd actually finished school. Back in those days, there was a fair bit of uh, mucking around with the poor old apprentices. I remember being sent down the road for a, a left-handed spanner. They also tried the old uh, can of stripy paint. Grant got offered this uh, business down here, and then after a couple of years, he rang me and said, would I be interested in coming down? I was his boss now, he's my boss, and you know it's been a long relationship and it's been a good one. I've just always liked the shape of them. And they're something that will never, ever go out of date. They don't age. Um, yeah, when my kids grow up, Porsches will still be fashionable. 30 something years later, I'm still working on the product because I absolutely love it. You know, it's, um, it speaks for itself. It's a reliable car um, and the people that own them are total enthusiasts. My granddad gave me my first car when I was 16. I couldn't even drive it. So I spent that first year that I couldn't drive it doing it up and, and looking after it. And I used to sit in it and talk to him. I had a, a deep affection for my granddad. I guess that's where my sort of relationship with cars started. I always have a lot of affection for my cars, to be honest. And I literally talk to them, as silly as that may seem. I was the kind of girl that had posters on the wall in my bedroom of cars as opposed to the local pop stars. My first Porsche that I owned is the one that I still own, which is my 968. She was the car that started our relationship with Auto House. The whole team there, especially as a woman, they don't treat me as if I'm dumb and only like the colour of the car. Having Grant look after our cars has made owning a Porsche more like just owning a normal European car in terms of cost. I don't think you need to spend more money on a Porsche. I think you need to find the right Porsche for you and really love it and enjoy it and, and spend time in it and have somebody look after it. The 968 was our second car for a very, very long time, and I always call it the world's most practical Porsche because it's got a fantastic boot, it's got decent sized bucket seats in the back for the kids, and the kids were comfortable in that seats until they were a good six, seven years old. I bought my husband a 996 911 Turbo. I happened to see that there was one online and when I saw the background I thought, I've got a feeling that's Grant's workshop background. So I rang him and said, is this one of yours? Can I come down and see it? He said, Nikki, you can come down and drive it. Between us, we arranged the whole secrecy of buying the car for Darren without Darren knowing. Thankfully, I, I control the bank accounts and stuff at home, so I was able to sneak the money out. 
that's his toy as far as I'm concerned. I do pinch it every now and then and he does let me take it to a nice lunch or something like that. It's beautiful but it's insanely fast. Ian kept visiting Porsche Centre Willoughby where we were there and he kept walking into the engine room where I spent a lot of my time back then and keep saying, you know, you should be coming and working for me, you should be coming and working for me. And I, at that time I just basically said, well, when you, when you want a partner and not a worker, come and see me. a guy by the name of Miles Sandy who was one of the mechanics there who had his own rally car and he asked me to come and help so I started helping him and then I got heavily involved in rallying and, co and in particular co-driving myself. I was taking holidays and my annual leave and competing in, in rallies in Australia and New Zealand and some in Asia. I probably owe this part of my, my history or career to a guy by the name of um, Wayne Bell and I was sitting in Wayne's lounge room and it was it was a decision that had to be made between working for him at Hyundai Motorsport doing Asia Pacific rallying or come and be part of Ian's business and Ian's organisation and buy into that and Wayne sat me down and basically said to me mate go and buy a business don't come rallying because rallying is only a short it could be a short term thing and I could, he could only offer me a one year contract so decision was taken to come and buy part of Auto House Hamilton and be part of that. In 2005, I finally got to a stage in my life where I was you know, comfortable enough to think about going rallying as something that I'd always wanted to do. I was given Grant's name and I rang him up and I said, listen, I'd like to go rallying. I'm thinking of Target Tasmania, but what I really like is gravel rallying. And he said, me too. And he said, I just happen to know the car. It's a 1972 RS replica, sort of. It's a narrow body car. Grant was part of the build process in, in 1999 and it was built for the 2000 London to Sydney Marathon. This car was available, we were able to do a deal to buy it and then the rest is history. Grant did the normal Grant thing where he sits you down and tells you you know, why you shouldn't be building this race car and now it's going to cost you an absolute fortune. And through that process we understood that, or he learnt more about me and the fact that my real passion was going gravel rallying. So we found this car, or he knew of this car being available and the fact that it had been built specifically for gravel rallying. And so he got it to his workshop and we went for a drive together. And as we were driving around, I said, you know, the only problem is I've got no one to sit in the co-driver's seat. You know, if I'm going to go gravel rallying, I need someone in the co-driver's seat. Well, I'll sit with you. Grant had a lot more talent than I did. As a co-driver, he was outstanding. And he kept telling me to go a bit harder and faster. It was great fun and it just, you know, said, that's it, we're going to do this for some time to come. The thing you learn as a driver with the co-driver is just to say, yes, sir. 
One of the great things about Grant is he has an opinion. He's incredibly enthusiastic and passionate with what he does and with rallying. And for the most part, I just defer to his decisions. Although we have had a couple of set twos and Barneys and you know, gone toe to toe from time to time. And occasionally we have to remind each other that the, the light in the forest is beautiful and it doesn't matter where we're coming. I've had a few, no, not, I wouldn't say near death experiences, but we've certainly had a few moments. Um, that happens when you're pushing and trying to win, you know, you, you're always going to, if you're not having moments in motorsport, then you're not trying hard enough. That's, a, that's my take on it all. Grant and I were in a very long uh, marathon rally in the South Island of New Zealand. And we were in day three or day four of the event. We'd had a very long section with a very poor road book and Grant said, you know, in 300 metres I want you to go left at the K intersection through that gate and I didn't slow down. And we hit a rock on the outside in the snow and rolled over into the creek on our roof and slid up the creek with the windshield inside the car. Fortunately the car was okay, we actually rolled it onto its wheels afterwards and got it going again and then for my punishment I drove 150 kilometres in a blizzard. Every time we go out we just try to make them easier to drive because you know in a rally when you're doing 50 kilometres down a dirt road it's very tense it's you know incredibly draining from the point of view of the concentration that's required both for the co-driver and for the driver and so the best thing we can do is to make the car as easy to drive at all times so that you know neither of us are uncomfortable with what it's doing when we ask it to do something. A rally car that we've built for Jeff is pretty, pretty special. It's, uh, it's a pretty amazing car. It's, it's probably the thing that also scares me the most. It's only the pilots who aren't scared that are having crashes. And I think the same is true in any form of motorsport. If you don't have a little bit of self-preservation, then you will go off and you will have a crash. The best project I've worked on would probably go back to the first Targa car that we built for uh, Grant as a navigator and the customer, uh, which was a genuine Australian delivered three litre Carrera. Every nut and bolt was uh, taken out, thrown away and started again with a clean sheet. Uh, some of the body panels too, uh, things were cut up and opened out and uh, such uh, contrast in its uh, original format really, but there was um, not suggesting Porsche got it wrong, but it's just to, to adapt it for this situation that made it um, something quite special. Bill's my original motorsport customer. He was the guy that came to me first and We've had a very, very colourful and long-standing relationship, I guess you'd say. This car, the 74 RS that we're sitting in, Grant and I built specifically to win Target Tasmania and beat Rex Bordbet. Um, <laughs> we unfortunately never achieved that. But we came second to uh, Rex in Targa and we won the classic competition in Targa in this and we were second outright. It was built from a body shell. It's a genuine wide body Carrera. It's built with an extremely strong roll cage. We were told by the builder we would die before it deformed. It's a 3.6 litre motor, which was, was the maximum size engine that we could run in tarmac rallying at the time. It's built specifically for um, tarmac so that it's not a high revving engine. It really doesn't like to rev much over 6,800. It's got a lot of torque and low down grunt so that it'll, it really gets off the mark quickly and it goes up hills and it pulls out of corners. It's not a circuit racing engine and it's got about 350 horsepower, I believe. Oh, 
trouble with that last lap. I, yeah, I, yeah. I noticed the lap before. I really you slide through the sweeper, and you got him quite cleanly. And yeah. then the last lap, I thought. Oh. I really, I saved enough in the tyres to really oh, yeah. punch it through that real tight section. Yeah, because you you gapped him. I throw a new set of tyres on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not in the course. You, you actually allowed six tyres. Oh, am I? Yeah. We'll, we'll put two new ones on the back. Yep. Okay. Pick the best for the rest. Yep. In regard to the finish of the car and the way it's been, it's been built specifically for functionality, really. Grant and the Auto House boys have done all this. I mean, it wasn't really my input. Remembering that the car was bought as a, a very sad, wide-body Carrera, we've done it just simply that way, mainly functionality and within the rules of Target. I remember the first time when Grant came home and said he was going to be, he wanted to be part of this, buy into this business. Um, I was frightened. I was scared. I didn't know what to expect. We spent the whole, that whole Christmas um, holiday period, I guess for most, it wasn't a holiday for us. We built, essentially built a lot of the internal structuring that you see at the workshop today. Cleaned the whole place up, had a big throw out of old junk and stuff. Ian had collected so much stuff over the years that really wasn't of much value. He needed somewhere to expand because where he was, he was, you know, just one of the numbers. So, and he had so much to give. And I just thought, I'll trust his judgment and if he thinks that this is a good thing, let's do it. just been married in 1996 when I took over the business and we also bought a house, nothing like a, a mortgage to make you commit to something. <laughs> At that stage I was actually a hairdresser managing a salon and the only way that we could do it, and Grant knew no, nothing about computing or business. I knew nothing about it, so we thought, let's do it, let's go for it. So I would come down and I would do the bookwork a few days a week and then manage the salon the rest of the time. It was tough, long days, and I just said to my, I just said to Grant, I said, I'm done with hairdressing, let's do this together. And I became full-time here, so that was a big decision for me because 13 years hairdressing and that was all I knew to come to something which I didn't know but I knew his drive and his passion and where he wanted to take it and I wanted to be part of that. I seem to be good at biting off more than I can chew and then just chew like hell to try and get through it all. I don't know how to, how to introduce Adrian. Adrian's just a total pommy git that loves his Porsche Boxster and thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread, but he's... I was lucky enough to pick up the Porsche in the GFC um, for about half the price of what I should have paid for it. I probably paid double doing it up, putting bits and pieces on it, upgrading the engine, the brakes. It feels more like my friend's 911 when I'm driving because it's got the 911 suspension on it, but it still feels light and nimble like the Boxster does. It's a bit quicker, the engine sounds more raspy. It's, yeah, it's just a fun car to drive now and, um, and it's different to any other Boxster that I see on the road. Me and my friend who's got a Carrera, we took the cars out down through the back of New South Wales, took it all out through the countryside up into the mountains, had some great drives. I think that's when I really let the car go and that's when you really start to enjoy the car, not for what it looks like, but you know, how it handles and how it drives. 
there's a prestige to them, of course. They're nice looking. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years on, they still look really good. It's my daily drive, but it's my weekend car as well to go on drive days in the country. I've been working on Porsche cars since 2005. I had a small stint on some BMWs for a couple of months at one stage and they're just not the same. I can't see myself working on anything other than Porsche. I came from another dealer not doing Porsches to a sort of um, family business, which was a good change because I don't really like the dealership in and out. I compare it to McDonald's, to be honest. Our customers know that we can't plead ignorance on anything with the cars. We're a specialist, it's what we do. We tell people we're a Porsche specialist. Um, we're not like your typical prestige dealership that may have a Porsche in there from time to time. So we did, we did so we put new hoses so, in. Service, new hoses, new caliper overhauls, so caliper kits, yeah. new pads in the front, yeah. and machine the discs. Yeah, so nothing else extra? No. What about the hunting thing and the rich thing? Tim reset the mixture. Right. And he said, as far as I know, he said it was, it was good. Right. Okay. He was happy with it. Cool. How is your island going anyway? How's my what? Your island. Bahamas? Bahamas? <laughs> are you still kicking back at Monaco like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what I'm doing. Wouldn't have thought your jet had range to get there, but... No, no I sold my jet. Oh yeah, you just leased any smarter. No, no, no. No, I bought two helicopters instead. Oh, good. And a couple of race horses. Nice. Oh, anybody else got that? Mate, no, that's very, that's very yeah. swanky, eh? That's the real deal. That's all the original books there. Yeah. I'm thinking putting the original radio back in. Oh. I'm getting old, aren't I? It won't work. No. The year of Ox. Have you still got the year of Ox? Whatever it was. Yeah, it's a year of Ox, mate. That one. Yeah. yeah. Chris, that guy that's down there in the car. Yeah. Talk to him. Yeah. Who He's is he from? He's the best. He's mobile. Oh, is he? he does all the, every dealer. Every Porsche dealer in Sydney. Right. He's man. Better than the old clunkers. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what he's doing today. Oh, what yeah. old clunker. The automotive industry is is full of people who are miserable, which, as, as a petrol head, I've I've never really understood. You're you're getting to to work with with the thing that that motivates you and that gets you out of bed in the morning. Order House Hamilton is by and large a, a happy place and although everyone has, has days when they aren't quite as sparkly as other days, sometimes it feels like a, a bit of a treat to, to be allowed to, to do what we're doing and still get paid for it. The first Porsche that I bought happens to be sitting over my right shoulder. It's a fantastic car. It's a 1993 968 Club Sport, factory motorsport edition. I think of this in a way as the predecessor to GT3s. Extra rare this one in that it's a, a non-aircon and no radio version. I got to admit initially I thought I, I would be modifying the car heavily, but when, I, when you looked at the specs from it from the factory, it was pretty accomplished piece of machinery and well beyond my limits at that point in time so I actually left it as it is standard and just set it up with a wheel alignment harness some safety gear and tracked it for a year or, or two without doing anything actually and I guess call it luck but managed to win its class championship every year it's ever run. <laughs> You'll find that the ability to to go and do a track day and then be able to drive home. And I, I got a bit, I think the first 10 rules of our club are about the, are that you've got to be able to drive home, you've got to be able to drive home, etc. And the Porsche mark is absolutely the car to do that. They've got the right balance of engineering around motorsport, yet durability for customers at club level or who are having a spirited drive on the street like myself. In terms of the engine on this, it's, it's something a little different actually. In contrast to say 911 with a flat six, this has got an inline four. It's a, it's a big inline four. It's got a three litre, four cylinder, 16 valve with variable timing on the camshafts, which was pretty cutting edge technology. I believe it had more torque than the Holden five litre V8 back in early 93 when it was created. 
I've often thought about whether I'd, I'd get a GT3. Um, it's still there on the list, but uh, I've got to admit, every time I start to look at the lap times that we can now achieve, so I'm doing about a 1 minute 47 on the Grand Prix circuit, and on the same tyres, GT3 road cars, 996s, 997s, are doing a 1 minute 46, maybe 45.9, so there really isn't much in it. And I think with a little bit more tuning and work on the suspension, uh, I'm looking forward to giving <laughs> giving some of the GT3s more of a run again. This car just loves Bathurst. It's okay on the straights. I get up to about 230, 240 down the straight and into the kink, but the ability to hang out and keep up with all of the 997 GT3s, uh, whether on slicks or semi-slicks, etc., and frankly, you can monster them across the top of the mountain. I don't, I don't want to be arrogant, but you, you really can take it to them. For more than eight decades, the name Porsche has been synonymous with engineering expertise and have recorded more victories than any other manufacturer in classic races, such as the 24-hour Le Mans. Ferdinand Porsche believed that design must be functional and functionality must be translated into visual aesthetics. Every part of a Porsche is the residue of sustained focus on function, engineering, excellence, and reliability. He drove to create cars that express power and speed, even while standing still. A small car with abundant power and brakes could accelerate rapidly and also have stopping ability to surpass the larger and more powerful cars. It was this approach that is at the heart of Porsche design and is for most the main attraction. The ideal of simplicity, quality, reliability, accessible engineering and design has been rewarded with car sales volumes that most other sports car manufacturers can only dream of. Ferdinand Porsche's vision and self-belief continues to imbue the design DNA and engineering prowess of today's Porsches. Posters of Porsches continue to adorn the walls of dreamers and be the cars owned by drivers. As time moves on, you know these cars one day will become old cars too. Um, it's important that we don't just rest too, too much on, on, the, on the old cars. It's going to limit our numbers of cars. We've got to just progress with time the same as Porsche are. And um, yeah, it's important to work on those modern day cars. Again, there's still avenues there we can look into and uh, get more out of those cars too. The great things about 911s particularly is that they're everyday cars, they're a car you can you'll jump in, you know it's going to start if you haven't driven it for a week. It's easy to drive, they're good fun, they're reasonably economical. Welcome to the toy shop as I call it. Uh, these are some of my cars, this is my daily driver I call it, not that I drive it every day. Uh, it's a C4S, it's a lovely motor, manual, I think all my cars are manual, yes they are. So this car here is the only right-hand drive 964 RSR that Porsche have ever built. I was stepping up a class, which was fairly exciting, but it's also such a, an iconic car. It's original. It's a hard car to drive. You've actually got to be driving it 100% to get the most out of them. It's a wonderful noise, the RSR. It's a, a deep sound, complete roll cage. It's a five-speed gearbox. They took the standard motor, which was 3.6 litres, out to 3.8 litres and it produced 300 horsepower. You can tweak them with the exhaust and uh, inlet manifolds and I think it got up to about 330, 340 horsepower, which is about as much as you can get out of an air-cooled engine. Above that they start to run a bit hot. This is an anniversary model 964, which I bought from Grant and I've enlarged the motor to 3.8, I've put the spoiler on it. So it's actually like a 964 Carrera RS uh, replica, it's the only replica I have. 
I guess I've slowed my racing down the last uh, couple of years, partly because of business commitments and partly because some of the Porsches that I race are a little bit outclassed with the modern machinery. This one is a 968 CS, which I used to race. I've done Targas in it and uh, production sports cars. I'm just taking the front of the roll cage out so I can, I can drive it on the road. It's, uh, they're pretty hard to drive with a full roll cage. If the police find you, uh, I'll end up with a big defect notice. I didn't want that. Collecting cars became almost a little bit out of passion. And when I went racing, I had a $21,000 1972 911S, which is worth another 100 now, I think, more than that. But I flared the guards and made it look like a bit more of a racing car. And when I finished with racing, and I thought, gee, this is a good car, I should hang on to it. And then when this one turned up, I then kept that, and I said to myself, I'm getting a collection here. And then I decided to put James on to look after my cars and bought this place here to start to store them. And so with James restoring them and, or maintaining them and me going out and collecting good cars as they come on, one or two a year, the passion has just grown. That was my first race car. I can't believe I raced a car so valuable. That's a 1972 911 S 2.4. A 944S2, which I do Porsche events with, and it's done a couple of Targas. I have a all-year cars and I have winter cars. So I have to come on down and say, for example, the 72S is a winter car, no air conditioning, and they're pretty hot in summer. Pretty hard to look cool when the sweat's running down your nose. One car did 4Ks last year. That's just four kilometres, down to get registered and back again. And that just started up after 12 months. Drove down, did the rego check, bring it back again, and it was fine. Now that's one of the great things about them. The earlier models take a little bit of throttle modulation to get them going. They're not as happy as the earlier, as the later ones. But yeah, they'll always start first go. My father was a, is, is a car nut, like he, it's, it's his fault that I am doing what I do and spend all my weekends at the racetrack and drive my poor wife crazy. Um, so we used to go to car races as kids and um, yeah, it's his fault and I've now convinced him to have his midlife crisis now that he's, they're empty, his mum and dad are empty nesters and he's just gone and bought a second hand Boxster. Caymans? Oh, the Caymans and Boxsters. We had a new Boxster, a brand new Boxster come in a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, nice. Wow, yeah. Well, what was your car anyway? I had the Meteor Grey 3.2 Carrera. Oh yeah. yeah. You delivered it to me once, years ago. You brought it to my house in French as Oh, was that you? That was me, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely my favourite car. <laughs> <laughs>I got my first car when I was eight from one of dad's friends. He said, yeah, I have this paddock basher and I, dad taught me how to drive through that and then he taught me how to get quicker and faster and using the handbrake and then I just raced around the paddocks, still doing it now. I started doing motor in 2007 and between 2007 and 2011 I won three state titles, an Australian junior title and state countercross title. The first time I got into Porsche was three days after we got it and I was 15. It was a serious eye opener. Pretty much my dream of the new Porsche is to just get quicker than Dad, pretty much just to beat him. Working with Grant's just, it's great. He definitely knows how to set up a car for the racetrack. He's got the, the team, the skills and he definitely has the passion. With the Motec system in the car, we can retrieve data off the car and they can look at what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong, compare it with Dad's data, overlay it with other data, 
and yeah, it, it's it helps you go a lot faster. Living the Porsche is just, it's awesome. Every time you're in the car, driving the car, it's just an absolute dream. It's, a, it's awesome fun. You just, I still can't get over it. It's a bit of an unusual thing with me because most Porsche owners love old Porsche and Porsche is a transitional thing which moves forward. We're high end of the IT, we live on the cutting edge of IT so I'm a little bit like um, a ferry Porsche. Somebody once said to ferry Porsche, what's the best Porsche? He said the next one. So hence I'm a guy that likes the current models, just keep moving forward, moving with the technologies, faster, better and safer. The best Porsche that I've ever owned would be the GT2, which you're leaning up against now. It's just fantastic. It is the most awesome car. It goes unbelievably fast. The acceleration, just everything about it is just unbelievable. Stock answer should be the newest one. My answer is the 356 because we've modified those for racing for decades, made them go very well for what we've started with, and that's what I race. 917 actually, without a doubt, yeah. 917, so iconic, difficult to drive, particularly in the early years, and uh, it's a beautiful car. Sounds great, uh, looks great, and uh, love to have a go one day. Yeah. Probably the, probably the 73 RS. Um, you know, an affordable car, yeah, relatively. But um, I like the older Porsches. Well, I'll surprise you about which is the greatest racing Porsche ever built. It's this one. I bought it new in 1984, so I've been driving this car for 29 years. And for 29 years of fanging it, the motor was never open. It was amazing. Hey, it's a little 76 911 Gemini Blue. <laughs> Silly question. <laughs> I guess the, the striking one that really stood out in, in my mind, because which was associated with the car itself, uh, was the 9083 that they ran at the Targa Florio and at the uh, Nürburgring, which was the pale blue car with the orange stripe the down, down, down the yes. front. Yes, right. that's the one with the big arrow on the front mud guard. No, that's, that's really difficult to say, but real my, my favorite is a Group Z type 962 or 956. It's only 12 centimeter difference between those cars. That was that was really a fantastic car. During the Grand Prix, we raced the 81 Le Mans winner, which is here, the 936 uh, Spider, and uh, that was a great thing. It was a real race, girl participating by 34 cars, and we finished second. And behind us, a uh, very strong car. So that's in the future now, girl. Not only to make the demonstrations like here, we want to race them again and preparing the cars for racing. Six years old, and I bought a little, a little matchbox board. It was a 911. I fell in love with them from there, and so it's taken me this long to be able to buy one. <laughs>
The first Porsche ever bought was a 911 996. You take it out there, you absolutely hog it. You just give it everything you can. You take it home, put it in the garage. And the next time you take it out, like four weeks time, you take it out again, off you go. And all you've got to do is just change the oil and change the tires. It's unreal, they just, they just go and go and go. Yeah, well I didn't think I'd ever be able to get into a racing car, let alone Racing. Something as great as this. Yeah, I, I do own it, I do drive it, and I do pit crew it. <laughs> so, so that cuts down on a lot of expenses because because we do it all ourselves. I tell you, the most humbling thing I've ever done is this motor race. Look at that! I'm fourth from the back. <laughs> If you come into a corner, I've actually got to say to myself, especially coming into this corner down here, is you can do it, it's okay, stay on the track. Because if you think you're going to slide, that's exactly what will happen. So you've got to look ahead, you look as far ahead as you can, and um, keep a positive attitude, and the car will do the rest. When you drive the car, it's like it connects to every nerve in your body, and you can feel everything in the car. It's unbelievable, like you can feel the road. Like if there's a, something slippery on the road or a nut or a boulder or even a stone, you can feel it. You feel it through the steering wheel in your hands, you can feel it in, the, in your foot on the clutch when you go to put it in, you can feel it on the accelerator when you put it down, you can feel it on the brake when you're braking, you can feel it in the seat through the bottom where, as you're sitting in it, you can feel it, it's unbelievable. Racing started on a whim really, it was a, just a, a phone call from a friend who uh, said that he'd found a, a second-hand Ford Falcon EA saloon car and that, that car at the time was I think something like $5,000 repossessed in bad order.
after a very wet and soggy round at Phillip Island once, which is not much fun with a, with a saloon car. I saw these beautiful, sleek uh, Porsche 996s at the time in, in an early round of the GT3 Cup Challenge when it first commenced a few years back. And I actually jumped on the phone from the pits at Phillip Island to a, a guy back here in Sydney who worked for a, a Porsche dealer who said, how do I buy one? There have definitely been a bunch of close calls. There's one sitting on YouTube right now, having to go infield at the chase at 250, 260 kilometres an hour when there was a slowing car just on my line. That could have ended in tears. If the car had have gone sideways into the sand, it certainly could have barrel rolled and anything could have happened. Across the board, Carrera Cup over the last few years has been safe and generally respectful racing. But you just don't race at that speed and at those limits without there being incidents. Last October, in the last race after a very, very good run, found the wall just uh, coming over Skyline. So you, you have to maintain respect and be very, very aware at, at all times because the bottom line is anything going at 270 kilometres an hour is, is the ability to bite you and bite you hard. I guess a lot of people have the desire, but it's like anything in life, you just need to take some steps towards it. You can race very affordably, and if you're in a pack of cars, it doesn't really matter whether you're doing 120, 220, you're using the same racecraft, you're having the same experience. Naturally in life, you want to progress through, so we, we find ourselves sort of where I'm at at the moment, and of course other guys have gone many, many times further than I ever will. You only get one shot, I'm 50 in January, so you know at the moment, I'm hanging in there reasonably well, but I don't want to look back in, a, in a 10 years or 20 years and say, why didn't I? In terms of the ability to compete with the class of driver that I find myself on the grid with, yeah, I think it is probably as good as it gets realistically at my age with my time availability. I think there's some amazing experiences to be had in addition to Carrera Cup, but I can't think of a, a better way to hone car and race skills than the, the very equal, competitive and sprint racing format of Career Cup. Actually, if you look down in the garage, my three-year-old daughter's driving a convertible white 356 electric model, and that's sitting beside mine, so uh, you could be forgiven for thinking it's a, it's a Porsche enthusiast family. In terms of just a daily driver, I'm perfectly happy with what I've got. Carrera uh, 991S cab, which is an awesome car, does everything so well. Couldn't think of anything much better to be honest, but I must say the new Turbo S is right up there and a couple of classics for good measure. Yeah, I think everyone had a little bit to do with the Group 4 car. There's a secret little carbon fibre badge that I put on the chassis of that Group 4 car that someone one day will find. But also, I think I did a bit of the interior work and the start button and a couple of suspension components, but everyone sort of worked on that car. <laughs> I don't think anyone didn't. That's actually nuts, that car. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. Um, I don't know how you drive it, actually. <laughs> A bit scary by the time you accelerate, you're already at the end of the street, so no burnouts though, you don't do burnouts in uh, Porsche, we don't do that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
a place and an environment that had a bunch of craftsmen and technicians as opposed to just mechanics. A place where people would come and, and enjoy working here and feel like they'd be part of something really, really special. That's what led us to build the Group 4. Iconic 80s tarmac rally car. No one in this country has certainly built one. It was all about you know, taking something old but then making it a little bit new, a little bit special. We didn't want to build an out and out race car. We wanted a more of a street hot rod for someone to take away on the weekend, go and have some fun, maybe go and do half a dozen track days a year and something that if someone got the urge in the morning, they could jump in and drive to work as well. First thing was it had to be a factory right-hand drive car. I don't care how well people say they convert cars from left to right-hand drive. There is so many things that can be done wrong, it's not funny. It was an English delivered car. They were a little bit known for being rusty, and that was fine because everything was coming off it. We were starting from scratch. We didn't want to build a 400 horsepower race car engine that's going to need a rebuild in 10,000 Ks. We wanted a car with a nicer shifting gearbox in it than the earlier cars with the 915 boxes. Even though we love them, they're nice and light, they are a bit more agricultural than the G50 gearbox cars. The interior is all Alcantara dash and you know, door trims and things and some couple of racing bucket seats and, and air conditioning. And air conditioning. And Bluetooth. <laughs> I hate air conditioning. <laughs> because, of, because of all the pipes and hoses and things. Yeah. It's nice on a day like today. But it just looks ugly. <laughs> yeah. I love every model of Porsche from the beginning to the current car. But for me, I find it hard to go past the classics, you know. Classic cars are all metal parts, are all bolted together. There's so much more mechanical noise. All modern cars of today are all really quiet inside. They're just not quite the same. So go on, just for a sound check, just introduce us to the room and who's in there and so, what are you doing? Hi, this is the engine room. Perfect. Run by Matt. Don't worry about that, because that's outside the anamorphic box. Okay. Yep. Quite yep. like it. What? <laughs> Quite like what it. What was that technical <laughs> jargon that just went Anamorphic. Yeah. We're shooting this all long and thin, like, like cinema screen. Okay. It's the same aspect ratio that uh, feature films use. So when you look at this, you're going to get that implicit association that you're watching. A feature film as yeah, opposed to video, which is yeah. more square. Yeah. This will be really long and thin. Show it on the big screen. Oh yeah.
look in a car, is it? It's a Porsche. A Porsche. Oh, I should have guessed. It's gorgeous. It really is. Do you like the stripes? I love that. I was just going to say, I love the things at the back. The colours, the red and the black, look great against the white of the car and the roof. Oh no, that's beautiful. 